Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh and today we're going to talk about transition state theory just a little bit. Okay, what does transition state theory say? Basically what transition state theory hypothesizes is it hypothesizes that there is a state that's in between the reactants and products and this is talking about one step, right? So if you have an overall reaction that happens in multiple steps, this is not what we're necessarily thinking about. That kind of idea with the overall reaction piece, it can have reaction intermediates, it can have all kinds of pieces, and we'll talk about that later. This is talking about one step in a multi-step reaction, or if you had an equation that was just one rearrangement, one chemical reaction. Basically what this hypothesizes is that there is kind of a hypothetical state that exists in between the reactants and products where you start to see the reactants bonds being broken and the products bonds being made, but they are not fully done on either side. Okay, so there's not a full breaking or a full making. There is in between of both. Okay, so in that case, and this is with the idea from collision theory, that you have to have the reactants come together in exactly the right orientation with the exact right energy for them to be able to make products at all. Okay, so basically what they're, this is saying is that there's a hypothetical state in the midst. We're going to call it a hypothetical in-between. Um, in a reaction where, oh, that's a horrible where. I'm sorry, I'm going to use a little bit of a cloth here. Where bonds are partially broken. And maybe we should say reactant bonds. Can you guys see that? Reactant bonds are partially broken. And product bonds are partially made. You can look in your book, they have pictures of transition states. To crystallize a transition state or to actually see that it exists um, is actually really hard. <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do and has only been done a little bit over time. So just FYI, this is not, this is really a hypothetical state. It's not something that we're going to see that's going to be made that's stable in any way, shape or form. This is an unstable intermediate. And it is often shown with a double, um, a double cross, right? So basically uh, this kind of symbol where you have um, kind of the sense of something's being made and something's being broken kind of how I think of the two lines across. Okay, how do we see transition states actually in things that we conceptualize, right, in chemistry? Well, the most common place we conceptualize transition state theories, transition state theory, I should say, is with energy diagrams. With energy diagrams, you're going to have energy on this side. I prefer, there's a lot of delta H's or potential energies on that side. I tend to go with delta G. I like Gibbs free energy. I like the fact that it is kind of the end all be all for a particular reaction as to whether that particular reaction will happen or not, whether it's spontaneous as it's written with nothing else added in. Um, so I tend to be that kind of person. You could put a delta H here or just an E just as easily, okay? And this is as the reaction progresses, okay? So what we're gonna have here is we're gonna have, we're gonna have the reactants. Okay. 
And I'm going to start off with the products right here. And we're going to talk about a one-step reaction. Okay, so when this reaction happens, it doesn't just go from reactants to products. Okay, the energy between the reactants and products is actually the delta G of the reaction. And I can already tell that this reaction is exergonic, which is a way of talking about delta G in terms of saying its delta G is less than zero. So it is a reaction that is spontaneous. Okay, endergonic is our way of talking about delta G's that are not spontaneous. Okay, so exergonic, exer coming from the same idea as exo for exothermic, and ender coming from the same idea as endo, which is for endothermic. Okay, so you've already dealt with those before. All right, so it doesn't just go from reactants to products, it actually goes through a transition state. And that transition state is the highest point of the graph. Whatever you're looking at, this diagram has to have a high point. The high point is that transition state. The idea here is that all reactions undergo kind of what we would think of as like a roller coaster, right? So they pretty much go through this beginning piece. The very first part of the roller coaster is getting up to the top, right? So you're going up, 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 up. That's what this is, okay? And then as soon as you get to the top, it's a free fall, okay? And most reactions are just gonna free fall. Even if they have to go up again, it's still gonna be in the midst of this free fall. All right, so in this case, what is this right here? What that is, is that's the amount of energy it took to get to the transition state. And that amount of energy is called the activation energy. My ability to write is not great today. I'm sorry. E sub A equals activation energy. It's the amount of energy to get to, to activate the reaction. Or sometimes people will call this not a transition state, but they'll call it an activated complex which is yet another way to talk about the transition state. Okay, all of these terms are basically very much the same kind of idea, right? So activated complex for all intents and purposes for us is gonna be synonymous to the transition state. Same thing, okay. Activation energies are fabulous. This is the amount of energy it takes to make this reaction happen. And I can tell already in this reaction that this is a one step process and that the amount of energy that it takes to activate the complex is actually much more than I'm gonna get out of it in the end, okay? What this would probably end up being is it probably be, end up being, yes, a spontaneous process, but it may not happen very easily just because of this high activation energy. So, what do we throw in at when we have this kind of occurrence? What we throw in at this point is we throw in a catalyst. And we say, how do we make this one-step reaction better? And the way we make it better is we no longer have a one-step reaction. We have a multi-step reaction. I'm going to draw over this. OK. So what you're seeing here is essentially between reactants. I'm going to rewrite this as between reactants and products. You have kind of this thing going on. Okay, in terms of my energy diagram. And we're gonna assume that it's still exergonic, still spontaneous. Okay, what does a catalyst do? A catalyst breaks a reaction that has a very large activation energy or that may be have a, an insurmountable activation energy into pieces. Right, so instead of having one hump and knowing this is a one-step reaction, a one, they call these hills, by the way, instead of humps. Instead of having one hill and therefore a one-step reaction, we now have three hills, and that is a three-step reaction. It's a multi-step reaction, right? And so what do we have here? What we have is we still have the delta G is exergonic. This is still the delta G of the reaction, okay? We still know it's an exergonic reaction, but now look what's happened. What's happened is instead of having an insurmountable activation energy, 
I cut that way down, okay, for the first step. So this is, would be an activation energy associated with step one. This would be the activation energy associated with step two. And this would be the activation energy associated with step three, okay? Now, what's really interesting is that biology spends a lot of time talking about how a catalyst decreases the activation energy of the reaction. I don't know many catalysts that actually do that very well. Okay, so in other words, what happens here, and I worked for, an I, I worked for a mechanistic enzymologist who had a real beef with this, so you know, give me a moment here for all of you biologists, biologists who are having a hissy fit, hissy fit or biochemists, okay? It's not that it decreases usually o the overall activation energy. It's that it breaks it into steps such that the slowest step now has a smaller activation energy than it did, okay? So in other words, if I call this the activation energy of the overall reaction, then usually the activation energy of the overall reaction is going to be equal to the activation energy of one plus the activation energy of two plus the activation energy of three. It's not that it doesn't, that it really decreases. It might lower it slightly, but not overall really. What it does is it makes it much easier to get to the top of the roller coaster so that your slowest step, which is the one with the highest activation energy, is much more overcomable, right? You can get to the top of that roller coaster. And once you hit the top of that roller coaster, then you're just free falling. And even if you have to go back up, which is what we're essentially saying here, it's you have the momentum built to be able to do that. That's basically what a catalyst does, okay? The best catalysts we know are the ones that, well, are really recyclable ones, right? Ones that are made, that are used in the first step and then remade at the end so that you can use them over and over again, okay? So in this case, what do I have here? I have the three activation energies. I have three transition states. This is transition state one. This is transition state two. This is transition state three. And these two valleys are now, I'm going to do a little star by these, right? The star means that these are reaction intermediates. What is a reaction intermediate and how does it differ from a transition state? Okay, the idea here is that with reaction intermediates, those are actually stable products that are made in one of the steps. So here, this first one is a stable product that's made, it's energetically sound, um, it's like lower energy in the end and everything, it has true bonds, it's not a transition state at all, it's not this kind of partial deal going on, this is true bonds being made, but the only thing about a reaction intermediate is, again, it's hard to isolate because as soon as it's made in one reaction, in one step, it is then used in the next step. So it's hard to catch, okay? Much easier to catch than a transition state. That's really, really hard to catch because it's basically unstable. This is much more stable, but is made in one step, used in the next. It's hard to isolate sometimes. And so because of that, those are reaction intermediates, and this would be the reaction intermediate for one, and this would be called the reaction intermediate two, and then you have the reactants in the products, okay? So, in terms of this, you have three transition states, you have three activation energies. The slowest step is the first step because it has the largest activation energy compared to the other two, and you have reaction intermediates as well. All of this is to say the multi-step reactions have Lots of different transition states. And remember, I can tell that this is a three-step reaction because it has three hills. Okay. All right. Until I see you next time, I bid you adieu.